Good afternoon, everyone. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. I see people are entering. We're so grateful people are joining us late in the afternoon on the East Coast. Great. I think I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kimberly Beer. I'm the Senior Director of Public Policy and Advocacy at the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. We're thrilled that you're joining us. Uh, we're really excited to have this very special guest and one uh, wonderful colleague to join to explain um, and share with us a really important course, uh, an opportunity to be educated for um, around research and for our community. And so I just wanted to briefly share a little bit about the Reef Foundation and what we hope to cover today as well. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Kim. We, I'd like to go over a little bit about our advocacy priorities since I oversee all of our federal advocacy efforts. And I'd like to tie in some of the key areas that where we focus on research and research funding. And then I will introduce our wonderful guest speaker and then we'll have an opportunity for Q and A. We'll also send around the 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 uh, recording and and feel free to to put any questions in the chat. We'll be monitoring that throughout the the webinar. So next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, I oversee all of our federal advocacy efforts on Capitol Hill and here in Washington D.C. And every two years we release a community needs assessment and we coordinate that through our team internally. Uh, we draft a survey to, to see how our community is thinking and what it is that they would like us to focus on, especially as it, as it pertains to our advocacy priorities. And the top issue we heard for the last several times that we've done this is around research. So we, of course, spend a lot of time on protecting the Paralysis Resource Center, improving quality of life for people with disabilities, but really where I need to improve on as a team and as an organization is educating our advocates on the importance of becoming an effective advocate for research and also understanding where the foundation is supporting efforts on Capitol Hill. So this webinar will be one of several that we hope to do, and we thought it would be great to introduce you to Barry and, and start from the beginning about where it is that you could start educating yourself if you don't or, or if you're not already familiar with this advocacy course. Next slide, please. So just as a review, and many of you know this, and if you don't know this, we invite you to become part of our, our grassroots advocacy network, and we'll put some contact information in the chat box. Our top advocacy priorities for this year, as I mentioned, is um, to protect funding for the National Paralysis Resource Center. It's a, a resource center that we've been proud to operate and oversee since 2002. And it is my job and the job of all of us internally and our advocates to ensure that Congress understands its impact and continues to allocate um, uh, the dollars for us to be able to support the community. The second one, of course, is around increasing our federal funding for several key agencies where we spend time educating them about who we are, but also ensuring that they know that our top priorities around spinal cord injury and paralysis. So these are several of the uh, agencies where we will uh, ensure that we're advocating for increased funding. We'll be spending more time this year educating our advocates on these three separate agencies so you understand what might be, what might be happening at the federal level, but I just wanted to ensure you that, that this is, is a priority for the foundation. And then, of course, the other priorities are around caregiving, finding caregiving solutions, as well as supporting improving air travel for people with disabilities, which I know many of you are familiar with and have supported our efforts in improving that on Capitol Hill. So I just wanted to put that all in context before we, we introduce our guest speaker. And please, again, please contact my colleague, Gerard. He'll put his contact information in the chat should you wanna learn more about our advocacy programs. 
So today we're here to welcome um, Barry. I just want to pull up to make sure that I have his introductory notes. Uh, Barry Monroe is the Chief uh, Development Officer of the Can Canadian American Spinal Research Organization, which was established in 1984 to fund targeted research to maximize functional recovery and cure paralysis caused by spinal cord injury. He also currently holds the position of the treasurer for the North American Spinal Cord Injury Consortium, which is a community-led organization whose mission is to bring uh, about unified achievements in research, care, cure, and policy by supporting efforts across the spinal cord injury community. And I'd like to add that the Reed Foundation is a member of this consortium. Barry is trained as a lawyer and he's practiced personal injury law for over 10 years. He is living as a quadriplegic and he sustained spinal cord injury in 1987. And he's been a very active advocate in SCI research for over 30 years. So I'd like to welcome Barry. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kim. It's great to be here. And I want to thank the Christopher Dana Reeve Foundation for giving us this opportunity. But more importantly, I want to thank all of you. Uh, I, the fact that you've tuned in today means you've expressed some interest. And many of you, I know, are champions or thinking about ch being ch Reeve champions. And I can't, I can't. Uh, really emphasize how important that is that we need leaders and we need people out there to really start moving the the, the ball forward and network that way. So uh, I, I just want to thank you so much for this opportunity. Can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, today, I really want to speak to you about the what, what we've been putting together for the last uh, several years called the North American SCI uh, Consortium SCI Research Advocacy Course. And what that is, is, is really a stepping stone that we think that will be a great tool for all of us to move forward and really advance ourselves in, in the cause of improving our quality of life and improving to the point where we can see restorative therapies that will help us either now or the next generation. We're excited about that. And I have to tell you a little bit about my background in that I had an injury in 1987 and I was one of those um, few voices back then when we said, uh, you know, I want to walk again. And I thought a cure for paralysis was, was some type of possibility, but frankly, I didn't know how to get there. And I remember sitting in the hospital in the ICU that night with my halo on and it was about three o'clock in the morning and I'm sitting there just wide awake thinking about all this. And, and the nurse sat down beside me and she asked me, what's wrong? And I said, well, I had my injury and the first thing the neurosurgeon said to me is, Barry, you've broken your neck and you'll never walk again. And that's it. I took those words hard and I, was, I shared that with her. And I said, it doesn't make sense. To me, science, by the way, I'm not a science guy, but science is ever always open-ended and it's always evolving. There's, there's a form of hope, frankly, in what we've seen in our society over the years and what science can do. And to hear the words never made no sense to me. And it was at that point, she looked at me and said, okay, so what are you gonna do about it? And that's what I'm not gonna talk to you about today. It's really, what are we gonna do about it? And I'm putting that to you, the listeners, because it's one thing to tune in and listen today, but I'm gonna ask you, what are you gonna do about it in terms of advancing the cause, so to speak, for yourself and for others who have spinal cord injuries? And when I talk about research today, I want you to know that it's not about, quote, the cure research necessarily. It's about all forms of research. We have to remember that when it comes to research and, and best practices and even in rehab settings, there is solid research behind all of those things before they even introduce it into a rehab center after, that we see after our injury. So those things that help improve our quality of life is all backed by research. And then we felt that that's something that we can really take part in today to discuss with you and frankly share with you this advocacy course that we built. Can we go to the next slide, please? And before I went, I thought I'd get into all this, I thought I'd give you a bit of a history lesson in, in more of the recent progression of quote, the movement to have people with lived experience or what others like to call patient oriented research involved in research. And really the beginnings of this in recent times was in the last decade. And it was really at the Praxis Conference in Vancouver where they invited uh, many researchers as well as people with lived experience to be there at a conference to talk about 
the state of research in spinal cord injury. And what we came away with was one solid fact, and that as they were presenting and talking about research, <laughs> there was noticeably no involvement of people with lived experience either speaking or partaking in the, in the discussion. We were invited as spectators, but not there to be inclusive and to be part of it. And that was, a, that was a, really a light went on that time, a shining moment really for all of us. It was our big aha that we have to do something about that. And so um, some people left that conference not very happy. And the, the movement was basically, we need to be involved and we need to be at the table. This is our lives and we need to take control of that. And frankly, we're being shut out right now. So instead of complaining or whining about it, we felt that we had to sit down and create a mechanism that would get us to the table on all aspects of SCI. So what happened was an idea was formed to create a, a, an organization, which is now called the North American Spinal Cord Injury Consortium. And it was formed, and with it was formed the idea of um, integrated knowledge translation guiding principles. The idea of taking research, but actually implementing it into space. So that was in 2017 and 18, when this took place, where we came together as a community. Shortly after that, we were invited to speak for the first time, really, people lived experience to speak at the NIH meetings. And at that meeting, it was a meeting called a decade of disruption, meaning what are we gonna do with SCI research, which is on average $40 million a year, sorry, on average $80 million a year at the NIH. Um, that we could look at and how the next 10 years of SCI research would go. And from that really led to what we had now, and what I'm talking about today is the SCI research advocacy course. So if you go to the next slide, a little bit of background on, on NASCIC is that, again, like I said, we came out of the Vancouver conference and it was really, it was a dissatisfaction of our role in that conference. So as we said, we got together and uh, worked with our friends at Unite to Fight Paralysis who is a founding me member of the organization, just like Christopher Dana Reeve Foundation is, um, met at the Miami uh, Working to Walk Conference in 2017, uh, drafted and passed a charter. And it was at that point on, <clears throat> we became an organization. So the next slide. <clears throat> and a really a brief overview. We're a grassroots organization and we, we look across all the continuum when it comes to community living with SCI. We wanted to be uh, active and united in our efforts. And we initially started with research. That was sort of the low hanging fruit where we felt we can make a difference. Our current membership it consists of three different levels of members. We have 60 community led organizations, which includes the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, United Spinal Chapters, PVA Chapters, Spinal Cord Injury Canada, and the various provincial chapters. Miami Project, et cetera, et cetera. Then we have over 333 individuals themselves have just joined. That, By the way, um, membership is all free. And we have 104 partner organizations. That would include academia, research institutes, universities, uh, all of those that feel like they want to be part of this community. And we, we accept them with open arms because it's going to take all of us to make things better for us with SCI. And our mission is very simple to bring about unified achievements in research, care, and cure, and policy by supporting collaborative efforts across the spinal cord injury community. But to achieve this mission, NASCIC will identify the gaps, communicate resources, and be, a, my favorite line, a conduit for collaboration between community of people living with SCI and the many stakeholders. Because at this time when we were formed, there wasn't that connection there wasn't that United Nations of SCI. There wasn't that Switzerland where everybody can go on a neutral basis and work together where we're not working against each other. And we felt that this was the safe place and we created that with NASCIC and we're very excited about what we've done to date. And I just wanted to share with you today, really the big, the big piece that's uh, started us off and out of the gate. So the next slide, please. I mentioned to you that we spoke at the NIH meetings working um, um, a dec you know a decade of disruption and really looking at the next 10 years. It was the first time that people with lived experience were really at a research conference and invited to talk about our perspective and, and, and our, our thoughts and how we think research would go. And 
before we went into that meeting, we actually sent out a survey to our community and did a needs assessment as well, much like you're doing here with Chris Renata Reef Foundation. And we asked them some questions around research. We asked them and we were very fortunate. And some of you that might understand research and surveys, you'll be impressed that we had over 1,825 people respond in 37 days. And most of the people are with lived experience. So that right there is the power of NASCIC. And I want you to really look at that number because many scientists drool over that kind of information and they need to understand that we have the reach of the community. More importantly though, we're listening. And what we heard was very clear that improving access to existing care and equipment, reducing the cost of living of SCI and increasing life, suspend, life expectancy is more important as short-term goals. And while new treatments are waiting to be discovered, they strongly agreed with that position. Then they also felt that they didn't feel like researchers, clinicians, people who live in the SCIs and their families, funders, industry, and insurers, and regulatory agencies are currently working together. They saw the disconnect to develop a successful pathway to move research findings from the laboratory or from the bed, sorry, from the bench to the bedside, as we like to say, and all the way in the community so we can actually use those. 57% said it's broken and we were listening. And then the last part is something that I think a lot of us know and think that when it comes to research and the focus of research, things like mobility are way further down the list when it comes to priorities and what needs to be addressed. Pain, bowel, bladder, regular independence, so that ability to do more on our own. And then mobility kicks in. So it's important to understand that, but more importantly, that those that are conducting research and looking for solutions to what we're considering as problems, realize these are our priorities going forward. And so that was the beginning of what we shared with them. And it was funny because at that time, they didn't necessarily want to hear what we were saying. It was odd for us to be at a conference like that, but we were telling the researchers, this is what the community has said. And it stops now that you get to tell us what we need we all together need to work together on the needs, the priorities of our, of our community. It wasn't received well. I said something to that degree at the, at the meetings and my colleagues did too. We literally got hate emails from some and in other cases we were embraced. So it's a bold new day and it was a time that we had to move forward, but we got to put our money where our mouth is and how we're going to get there. So go to the next slide, please. Really, we had to look at this in a systematic way. And we had to look at what was being developed at the time in terms of how we can work together with the research community and clinicians. And really, we were very fortunate at the time that in terms of, um, of a methodology of how to do that, we were fortunate to work with what are called the integrated knowledge translation guiding principles. And these are the eight guiding principles that I thought I'd share with you today. It means partners develop and maintain relationships based on trust, respect, dignity, and transparency. Partners share in decision-making. Partners foster open, honest, and responsive communication. Partners recognize value and share their diverse expertise and knowledge. Partners are flexible and receptive to tailoring their research approach to match the aims and context of the project. Partners can meaningfully benefit from participating in this partnership. Partners address ethical considerations and partners respect the considerations and financial constraints of all partners. When we say partners, we're talking about the researchers, clinicians as partners, and the people with lived experience as partners. So these are the guiding principles, but how do we get there? Well, we had to keep a lens on defining tokenism because the initial involvement of people with lived experience in research will say, hey, we got that guy that's on our research team, and um, there we go, and frankly, where this sort of erupted, the tokenism was a response to some funding bodies require a personal lived experience on their grant application for research. So we always knew when that grant deadline was coming, uh, many of us would get that email blast about two hours before midnight on the date of the deadline, looking for somebody to sit on their committee because without that individual, they would have no grant to, to submit. And that's sad in the beginning, but it's a way that we had to sort of define that we have to address tokenism in this piece as well. But I think the more importantly, what we felt was we didn't have the capacity. 
we could argue right now that there are more researchers out there looking for people with lived experience to work with than there are people with lived experience either wanting to or able to work with them. So that's why we thought we'd address the capacity piece with the SCI research advocacy course. Next slide, please. And by being in that SCI research advocacy course, we really relied again back on the integrated knowledge translation piece. And if you look at this wheel, it really illustrates all of it. It was developed in 2017, but it tells the story of the journey of what we can do together, working together. So first of all, it starts off with, what is the research question that we wanna ask? Well, let's develop that with us, not you in a lab on your own. Talk to us about that and we'll, we'll, we'll give you that help. And then looking at the funding of the application, what's the role of the person with this lived experience on the grant itself? Very important. More and more funding bodies are requiring that. If you don't have that person, you're not gonna get funded. So that's very important that they've done that. And then we look at the partnering and design and look at how we can work as consultants, frankly, to help shape the design of the study. And then we integrate people with SCI as equitable members on the research team that evolves from that. And then we include them in the analysis and the interpretation of the findings. So after a study has been done, bring that person back in with lived experience to share and work with on what you found out of the analysis. Because to a person that doesn't understand spinal cord injury, they might see things that maybe that their endpoints were what they wanted or a failure. And then the person with experience say, well, it might not be what you wanted, but this is really valuable information that we could spin off on and gain from. So th this, these are the kind of opportunities that we want to promote and advocate for. And then at the end, of course, we're looking at dissemination. I'll talk a bit about that today which is very tricky. It is you, you, the people that are talking one-on-one -on -one with individuals with spinal cord injuries that can disseminate. You become knowledge bearers. <laughs> you are the ones, you're the old man on the, on the mountaintop that knows all when it comes to these things. When in the eyes of a newly injured person, you can have a, a, a great girth of information that you can share with them. And we're hoping today that what we share with you, you can spread that on and share it to others. Next slide, please. And this is an example when we talked about tokenism before and what engagement would look like, because it's not just about being engaged, but meaningful engagement. So at the very top of the pyramid, it's actually a negative. That's the one person brought in all the time. And I bet you a few of you out there have been asked over and over again to participate in something in re relation to research. And that's, that's fine, but it's not enough. And we need more of us to do more of that. And so the idea is to include multiple people to build partnerships in the community and then have the community help us build more capacity. So that's what we're trying to talk about today is about building that capacity through the SEI research advocacy course. Next slide. So the gaps that we established, I go back to what we said earlier on that with uh, NASCIC, we had to look at right away, what was the gaps because that's part of our mandate. And um, I like to quote our former president and founder of the, of the or co-founder, one of our founders of it, uh, Jennifer French, who said, we're gonna plant our flag here. And the flag we plant, planted was building capacity in SEI research, having a seat at the table, but being a meaningful participant at that. But we looked at what are the challenges here? Well, first of all, there's not enough of us that want to do that or feel comfortable doing that. And then part of the reason is this complexity of research. People hear research and a neuroscience the scientists talk and they go cross-eyed or even frankly an OT and physio that are working on a study for quality of life and your eyes go cross-eyed and so they're not comfortable in that setting unless they have a, potentially a bio, biology or their self-taught uh, background um, it just doesn't feel right and then researchers and clinicians they don't understand SCI and so they don't even know how to engage they don't know how to speak spinal you know to us and understand and some of them are very timid about how they approach us because they're afraid of offending us in some ways sometimes. And what they don't realize, all of us aren't all the same. And so that's something that we have to teach them. And then the, the other thing is just straight, a straight mechanism was looking at how do we connect people that have expressed interest in being advocates in research and those researchers and clinicians that are looking for advocates in research so we tried to address all of these things and I'll explain how we did that going forward. Next slide. We developed a working group 
and I was proud to work with um, so many great people. Kim Beers was one of them from, from Chris Renina Reeve Foundation. And Kim, you were fantastic. Having these people um, working together, we met every month and we decided to map out what it is that we think we need to do to build an advocacy course. Now, this isn't new stuff. Uh, a new research advocacy course has been used in many other areas. In fact, our, our friends with breast cancer, the breast cancer survivors are the more modern day group that were raising hundreds of millions of dollars, but really didn't have a seat at the research table or they felt like they weren't being heard in terms of prioritizing input on clinical studies, all of those things. So instead of complaining about it, they decided to go back and teach themselves about how the process works and about um, really understanding the research in a very lay point of view. And our friends with Parkinson's, our friends with MS, they themselves have also adopted a form of course where they've taught themselves uh, this way. And this was pre-COVID um, when they would develop these sort of weekend retreats where you go away for two days and take a course in different regions of the, of, of the continent. But now, um, frankly, this was all going down during COVID where the virtual world really took hold and virtual learning really was brought to the forefront. And so we decided to create an online course, uh, which is all absolutely free. But to do that, we had to look at what does the community want? So as you see in that list, these are just examples, but we had over 19 people that sat on this committee that met uh, consistently for over two and a half years. They were fantastic. And I would go in with an agenda every day, every meeting and, and come out scratching my head saying, this was none of this is what I planned to talk about, but I'm so impressed. And I would come out learning more and more by these people. And the passion that these people brought was fantastic. You can just feel it every meeting. And an hour meeting was just not long enough for us. We always went over, but they were great. And from what this group did was they mapped out what they thought the content for the course would be. And then we broke it down into pieces. And those pieces were also uh, tackled by subcommittees who would look at specific topics, experts in the field who might not even be on this group, but we went to them for their input. And they're very, they're very, very grateful in helping us do that. So it was a very, a very successful team, I have to say. And we couldn't have done this without the generous support of the, of the Craig H. Nielsen Foundation and our friends at Christopher Dana Reeve Foundation, uh, PVA as well, and many other uh, corporate partners that helped do that as well. It was just a fantastic adventure, so to speak. But now we have to really move forward in how we built this thing. Next slide. We look at the benefits. We wanted to make sure that what we built was what people really could benefit from. And the idea was, you can call these goals as well, to increase their knowledge of the research process in both current research and to be better advocates in the research setting. Increase their knowledge of biology. How many of us really know what the heck has happened after a spinal cord injury? The mechanism, like why am I not getting better? Nobody ever explains that to us, but we do that here and we break it down into lay terms. And it's one of my favorite modules in the course where they actually explain the biology of the injury. So you can understand where all the research is going in terms of helping, helping trying to restore function and trying to restore um, things that can help us in our daily living. So that was important. We also felt that upon completion of the course that they would sign up and what we have at NASCIC is a project engagement database. That database really reflects people that are expressed interest in research from being involved in studies, but more importantly, to be advocates, part of focus groups, et cetera. And we wanted to make sure we had those people captured who have expressed that willingness. And then we can share their, their enthusiasm with those that are looking for help. And we also wanted to continue to stay connected with these people so they can learn more about uh, other partnerships and other opportunities. And we want to take this new knowledge from the course to advocate to our peers and really about the importance of the voice of lived experience in SCI research. And I can't emphasize again, when I say research, it's everything. It's everything that we do, uh, surveys, focus groups, but everything that we do that can make our lives better, a better seat cushion, a better wheelchair design, uh, how to improve on pressure sores, and then frankly, how to restore function uh, and, and the various things that are going on there. Some sh very short-term goals, and some very long-term goals, but they need us at the table, but we wanted to be ready for that call so that we're ready 
to be there as those advocates. Next slide. You know, the one thing that we, we found in this is that the interest of the research community was very high and, and, it, and it was just a, a nice surprise to hear. And we realized that they too wanted to know more about SCI because they don't, they just don't understand it as much as we do. And if they're gonna be designing studies, they gotta understand that a quadriplegic can't be at the lab uh, every day at 8 a.m. and you live 40 miles away. It doesn't work that way. And they need to understand that. And these are the kind of things that when it comes to design and studies or participation, that if they don't talk to us first, that the chances of success in their studies and in clinical trials are not as good as if they consult with us in the first place. We can help design it and we can help implement it and we can help disseminate that information. So those are the things that we've been working on. Um, we, so these people understand that and what they've done, and this is mainly a lot of the younger, uh, new, new recruits to research have all really expressed and many of them have taken the course uh, already and they've expressed an interest in working with people with spinal cord injuries. So we're quite excited about that and, and their involvement going forward. And we addressed it in our curriculum in the study. Next slide, please. So here it is the nut, in a nutshell, I just wanna share with you what these modules are in summary. So that when you, if you decide to take the course, you'll know what you're taking and understand what you're getting into. The course itself, frankly, is about six hours long. Um, to some that might seem long, but if you chop it up and do it in different segments, two or three modules at a time, you'll get through it in a matter of two or three sittings. I just wanna let you know that. The first module deals with the introduction of research and advocacy. Really what I've been going on about. <laughs> it's just a, a, a snapshot of what our role is and what it should be and what we can define it to be. The next module is understanding the research process and understanding R&D decision makers and how they come about things. What is ethical approval uh, when they have to do a study? What does the FDA need when they, when they want to approve a device or a drug that will help people with spinal cord injuries? All of these things, uh, we have to go through that. Now, we all remember during COVID, understanding phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials when it came to vaccinations. But that was a bit of a primer. This is more in depth than that. But again, it's all in lay terms. I want you to understand this. This is not a science course. It's in lay terms. And then we look at models more similar to humans, uh, pros and cons. So we have to address that spinal cord injuries, unlike other conditions, is, is very unique in that we're very heterogeneous. Many of us are different. And it's, it's a challenge for researchers. You know, looking at the same cervical injury of an individual and with another could be completely different in terms of its outcomes and function or the body type. It's incredible the differences. I once heard that every single spinal cord injury is like a fingerprint and it's true. So we address that. So why is it taking so long? What are the challenges for recruitment? And we deal with that there. Then module four, I alluded to that earlier, the anatomy of spinal cord. It really talks about your spinal cord, what's going on in the central nervous system and really what happened with the injury and why it's been disrupted and why it doesn't quite heal the way you want it to. Module five deals with secondary complications. Many of you know what I'm talking about. It's, a, it's becoming a bigger and bigger issue because frankly, I wish everybody could watch this module when they first have their injury because it really talks about some of the preventative things they can do proactively instead of reactively and finding out, oh no, this is osteoporosis, yuck. I, you know, I bumped into a wall and broke my leg, that's not good. Or, or they're getting their first pressure sore that everybody warned them about, but they get it. This talks about that, talks about the evolution of our injury. We are sort of a certain body type after an injury, we kind of go our own way. And then it's about 20 years later and we find out that things have changed, bowel and bladder, they're not reacting the same way they used to. We talk about that there. I think it's important and it's important for researchers to understand uh, too. Then I get into the, what I call the sciences. There's, so there's, we talk about, and many of my neuroscience colleagues have agreed that they might not have labeled these things the same, but these next four modules kind of capture in essence, all things in neuroscience. So the first one is talking about cell replacement. And it's really more about um, the early stages 
of more acute treatments that people could have at the time of injury. Let me go to the next slide. Module number seven, it deals with axon growth and promotion. Again, that, that more of the acute stage. Then we have stem cells, the bigger piece, which we can talk about in regeneration and neural repair. And then there's brain interface. And this is really what we call neural trap, neuroplasticity. So with epidural stem, the famous thing everybody's talking about right now, we talk about that there. Activity-based therapy, we talk about that there. It's really all things neuroplasticity, very, very broad subject but how it's being used to potentially bring back or regain function for people that have suffered a spinal cord injury, again, in the chronic stage. So this is exciting and it's really, I think it's informative, but it, this, it's a really the tip of the iceberg when you can get into this. We're not trying to summarize a neuroscience career from a neuroscience in a, in a 20 minute module. That's not what we're trying to do. But at the same time, each module will have and does have supplementary material. So if someone wants to do a deep dive on activity-based therapy or epidural stem or brain interface, they can go into that and read articles and scientific journals uh, that have been printed and allowed for us to pre-print, sorry, and to post. And they can go in and do that. Or web website links to other, other uh, informative uh, sites that can give more of a scientific explanation if that's what they want. Number 10, this one's huge. Majority of our research is quality of life research. It's not SCI um, restorative necessarily. It's talking about everything from exercise to diet to psychosocial research. You know, like I said, a better seat cushion, better equipment. All of these things um, are addressed, but there's a lot of theories out there. And really, if you want to implement them in the mainstream of therapy and how we can promote these things that we think are create better lifestyles and a healthier body, we need to have the research to back it up. And we need us at the table. You can't just have a research idea put together. Let it generate it from our community. Let us be the ones that are there and advising these great clinicians and researchers who are dedicated to helping us. But we need to be partners and be part of that. So that's why we talk about there. And there's, we talk about the mechanisms and the role of some of the lived experience that they can have in that. Module 11. It's a nice 50 minute module, but it's really talking about a lot of testimonials to researchers, SCI 101 for researchers, we call it. And it's exactly what it is. We talk about the things they don't get in a textbook. We talk about the daily living challenges that we have, um, some of the problems that we go through, even things talking about self-esteem and independence. We share that with them. So they have an opportunity to see the inside on people with spinal cord injuries, and we do that. And then the last module, this is it. It's the end where we say, congratulations, you finished this course. But we also say, here are your opportunities for advocacy if you want to go. You know, we're not saying that you have to be an advocate by after you take the course. Many people just want to take the course for information, and that's fine. But many people have also expressed they need a basis or a knowledge-based foundation so that they're more comfortable in their own skin and telling their truth. When they're invited onto a research team, they are not there to be closet biologists and neuroscientists and advise on the study that way. They're there as experts in spinal cord injury because all of you out there with injuries, you are experts. You have hundreds of thousands of hours, actually, frankly, months and years of experience in this webinar right now that is priceless and it should be respected then you need to share that with others because we can make things better for all of us by sharing our own truth. And that's what you're, that's what this course can help do. It gives you the confidence to speak a little bit louder and perhaps more precise or be able to take in what you're hearing and understanding where the fit or what's wrong with what they're saying. And if you get the right people in the room that are open to that dialogue, you're going to see some great things happening going beyond um, just, you know, just the, the, the beginnings of advocacy. You're the beginning of greater ideas to come down the road. Next slide. So we built it. We launched it last spring. It's almost coming up to a year and we've been promoting it. And so far we're, we're having some success. It's tough because frankly, I've, uh, we've, I've talked to the model centers. I've made presentations at conferences. Uh, many of my colleagues at NASCIC have made a presentation. These are the example of conferences that have been listed. And we continue to, con we continue 
to share this to the clinicians and researchers. And we asked them to share this with the people of lived experience that they're treating. And then we try to talk to the, really the community-based organizations. Again, our friends at United Spinal, our friends at PVA, our friends at SCI Canada. We're constantly talking to them and asking them to share this, much like I'm doing here today. But I know one thing, the best way to disseminate this information is through peer and champions like yourself. It's the one-on-one -on -one meetings with individuals who can talk to the individual themselves. And when someone asks that question, are you ready for it? Here it comes. You've had a spinal cord injury. And don't tell me any of you that have had a spinal cord injury have never asked this question. What's going on in research? What's happening? What's new? My aunt's all over me on this one. My mother won't stop. Tell me what's going on. Here it is. Here's your answer. Send them the link. This link will open those doors and ask that. And that person can then find out. You don't have to sit down and break it down. It'd be great if you could. If you want to take the course and do that, that would be great. But here's your opportunity. And when I shared that quote, quite frankly, uh, with SCI uh, trauma nurses, the amount of nurses that have been really dodged, they're constantly getting people inundated with these questions about research. They don't know how to answer it. Well, don't answer it. Show them this link. Let them find out for themselves. Let them learn. Teach a person how to learn. And they can take that knowledge and they can really prosper with it. And more importantly, it'll want them to ask more and demand more. And that's the whole point of it. Asking and demanding for better. And that's what we should be doing. But we can't do that unless we're confident and we feel that we have that knowledge base to do that. That's what we think. And we stand by that. So the next, next slide, please. Um, and then, uh, you know, really, it's been a challenge. And I want to share that with you because I'm going to talk about something else a little bit at the end of this discussion and that it is so hard to translate this information from meeting with uh, large conferences and getting to people. And really, the, the only way we can do that is, is I frankly think through peer support and champions and health coaches that deal one on one with people with spinal cord injuries, because it's it's by introducing it that way we're going to see a better uptake. What's happened now, the challenges of what's happened now is that when I had an injury, my injury in 87, that's a long time ago, I'm a quad, um, C5-6 tetraplegic. Uh, I had 10 months, 10 months in rehab. Uh, that would now translate to about 10 weeks. So people that are going through rehab now, their head's spinning. They don't know where they are. They're worried about the housing, a chair, the equipment that they need to go home, care, and more importantly, what the heck has just happened to me? They don't know where they are, who they are yet. And to, you know, to give them this information, it, just, it might be just too soon. But when we were in rehab for longer settings, I can honestly say that you, through osmosis, you picked up a lot of things um, along the way in networks and people. So you learned a lot just by bumping into people and, and hearing things. And I got to tell you, my experience, and I'll, I'll say this over and over again, the best and most things I learned were from people who lived experience who were maybe a few years ahead of me, coming back to visit, peer support. That was very important to me because, number one, it showed me that I can get out in the community on my own like they did with that level of injury. But more importantly, they all the tricks of the trade that no physio or OT or, or trauma nurse can ever share. Or know about. It's us that can share those learnings together. And that's important. Next slide. I, I love this quote. Um, I, 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 I firmly believe in this because this is the part that drives everything that we do. I say, blessed are the storytellers. Every one of us are a storyteller. We can tell our story. And when we tell that story, we're, we are sharing our expertise and our knowledge. And I firmly believe that by doing that, we're helping other people understand our challenges and our priorities. And the more we're involved with that, the more and better research is conducted as true partners in this. We must be partners in research and as equals, uh, not an afterthought. Um, we have to be compensated, for example, with true honorariums or even consultancy fees where we can we can accept the money because I know there's challenges for many of us to do that. 
But we have to be looked at that way, that we're not just filler to help a grant application. We are, should be truly the experts, and frankly, in my opinion, sometimes the most important people as expertise in a, in a group when it comes to SCI and the issues that are at hand. But blessed are the storytellers, and that's you, all of you. Every time you tell your story, you've influenced the other world. People, as you know, don't understand what we go through. They don't understand that when we're sitting in a chair, somebody might be suffering from excruciating chronic pain. Uh, somebody might have just had a bowel involuntary. Somebody might have a UTI. They don't see any of that. They don't see any of that. They see that guy or gal can't walk. And it's important that we help educate everybody. But to do that, we need the vehicle and we need the confidence. And that confidence is what we can find in the knowledge of taking this course and understanding the process and understanding the research that we want to talk about and all the things that go with it. But again, in lay terms, that's important. Next slide. So I talked about dissemination and Really, the next chapter of, of NASCIC is, uh, you know, we talked about planting our flag and research. The next big piece that came out um, in terms of uh, what we heard from our community and our partners was really how do we organize, um, frankly, information? Much like I'm talking about today, it's just one piece. And we felt that we would come together. This is all, again, part of our network of all of us together, creating what they call the SCI powered network. And it's bringing the organizations as agents for change together. And we wanted to move forward. And the first item on the agenda is how do we deal with all those resources that are out there? I mean, I'm, I'm simplifying the question so you understand. Next slide. And what we did was we were very fortunate to receive a grant from the Gray H. Nielsen Foundation. Go next slide, please. And we took away from that. Um, our proposal was looking at guiding principles of having, everyone has something to share. We all have knowledge and wisdom of lived experience. We speak from our own experience. We, have, we are positive and respectful and collaborative in this space. And we add new different perspectives and it's okay to disagree and it's okay and, and discomfort in what we say. We only do better when we work together. That is absolutely our, 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 our guiding principles moving forward with the SCI Power Network. Next slide. So the goals and objectives were really to, to deliver a community-driven framework of credible, trustworthy spinal cord information. This is important because when somebody goes to look up something and they go down the Google rabbit hole, they're not sure what is credible and what isn't. They have no idea. And we think we need to develop a system that we can do that. And our first objective was to develop, identify a high priority of information. So the things that are really matter to people or people should know about right away. And then to conduct a landscape search of common characteristics of inclusive and trustworthy information and resources. So going out and say, what's priority for somebody? Say like pressure sores. All right, then let's find out what are the best resources out there there are and identify them. Next slide. So we had th three deliverables, really provide a gap analysis, develop the metrics of SCI information and resource to create an SCI power network, kind of like a good housekeeping seal of approval. And this is not coming from NASCIC, it's from all of us together. And create a design criteria reporting creating consisting of solutions, definitions, and systems characteristics. And key attributes needed to be a community-driven information exchange. So really, we're talking about how would we do this? What's the platform that we can do? We don't know that. We have ideas, but we want to hear from all of us together. What's the best way to get this information out that's easy and readable and organized for somebody that wants to know something about SCI? Next slide. So this is the overall work plan. Um, you can see we're right in the middle of it now. We've gone just going through the needs assessment. Then we'll go into landscape search and then we're looking at the deliverables. And this is all gonna be done in 2024. And um, we are moving rapidly on this. And after this, we would probably be looking at, once we've had this, we'll have some conclusions and decide, okay, now what are we gonna do with this information? How do we organize it? And how do we put it out there so that the Christopher Dane Reeve Foundation isn't competing with United Spinal and isn't competing with PVA and SCI Canada, that we're all sharing this information together. We're all respecting, quote, our sovereignty, as I like to say, our independence as organizations, but going towards so they can easily and readily get to these pieces. Next slide. 
All right, um, back to Skyrec. Um, that's what I call it, SCI Research Avenues, of course. Coming soon. So I've told you the traditional way for the full course where you get a certificate at the end of the course once you're completed. And at, at the end of the course, you have an option of choosing whether you want to be involved as a research advocate or whether you want as a researcher to have somebody involved in your piece. But along the way, we felt that these are great resources that might not be what everybody wants. So what we're talking about doing now is creating what I call Skyrack Lite. It's really repackaging some of the modules and some of the videos in the modules to be more specific and therefore less, less amount of work to go through. You don't get certification, but if you wanted to know more just about certain neuroscience topics and that's it, that's what you would do. If you wanted to know about advocacy, that's fine too, we'll do that. Or if it's quality of life, we can do that. We can package it in different ways and identify that for people. Uh, it's a two day course, or we can put offer how we can do the course differently in group settings, do a two day course, do it like a walkthrough um, where you're proctored and somebody's there supervising the course. Great news with the help of the Reef Foundation, we have Spanish translation coming to you probably by June. And in Canada, our French friends are helping us with a French translation. So we will, this will be available in three different languages, which is great. The other option we're doing for disseminating is possibly like working with our friends at for example, at United to Fight Paralysis on a book club setting. So, you know, we everybody be given the task of going through a few modules. We get together once a week and talk about what they learned and any questions they had. Maybe we bring an expert in. We want to do, bring together quarterly webinars and Facebook chat groups that we're just putting together now. So graduates from the course can talk and share their experiences together. And then we can really... Uh, go through how we can make things better. The one thing that we're always doing is listening to you as a community and, and improving upon it. And all of these ideas are what we have gained from listening to you since we've launched the course. So we want to be very proactive and act on that way. Next slide. And that's it. <laughs> I, I really want to thank everybody uh, for taking the time and listening to me today. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's close to my heart, close to many of people that, that have worked on this. They did a great job and we've been very fortunate to have the support of the community. It's really brought us together in, in really ad addressing a gap that we want to do. There's a QR code here that you can download to get onto the course if you want, or just go on our website at nascic.org and you'll see prompts to take you to the course if you want to learn more in Frank, or if you want to register the course. Registration for the course is free. Um, membership at any level is free. So we wanna make sure that we're open for all of you and love to hear from you. I uh, guess I got some time now to take some questions. Thank you so much. Barry, thank you so, so much. That was a ton of information and we appreciate you so much um, getting that in, in under an hour. We appreciate everyone's attention. And we're the Reef Foundation is so privileged to be a part of these projects. And I want to let the um, audience know that uh, we've put the link into the chat about the course. And also we just so you know, Barry, there are several people who are interested. So they have they've said sign me up. So hopefully they will sign up. But I also want to commit to everyone attending that this is kind of just the first step for, for especially for the Reef Foundation. We're committed to ensuring that. Uh, you get more timely information and more ac and up to date information on what's happening in research, how the Reef Foundation is playing a role in that, and how we're continuing to work with many of our partner organizations to to ensure that everyone gets the information that's accurate and timely, and that you feel empowered and educated in order to get, you know, the the care and um, participate in opportunities to advance research. Um, for, for you and loved ones and for those who depend on us to do that. So I just want to say thank you for everyone's attention and we hope um, you'll stay connected to us and we'll send the recording out, but I don't see any other additional questions. All right. Well, Barry, thank you for your time. We hope everyone thank stays you. well and we'll be in, we'll be in touch soon for, with another uh, research webinar soon. Thank you very, very much. Take care, everybody. Be well, and thank you so much, Kim. I really thank appreciate you. the opportunity. Take care.